Nope. Oh, first time in Prague. Prague. What do you think so far? It's, it's beautiful. Really pretty, yeah. 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 One of the nicest hotel rooms <laughs> I've ever stayed in. Yeah, that's great. Well, yeah. Um, the design's a little weird, but it's nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're staying at Le Palais Hotel for anyone that's wondering. Um, what can we look forward to tonight? What do you got in store for us? Um, music from the first two seasons of Stranger Things, obviously. Um, probably more on the experimental side of things. So we try to get a good amount of that in there, just to kind of retain the uh, mood of the show, since there's not going to be any actual footage from the from the show. We have a uh, a light rig that's kind of a loose interpretation of some of the motifs in the title sequence, but it's more just its own thing that uh, our friend Marcel Weber will be operating. So that should be interesting to look at. I've only seen it from on the stage, but it looks good. Atmosphere me. experience, I guess. Cool, yeah. Cool. I saw it in Los Angeles, so. I can attest it's going to be great. I hope everybody has tickets for tonight. If you don't, buy them now, quickly. Um, uh, my first question for you guys is, uh, did you ever think your careers as musicians would ever land you in a situation like this? Um, the scale is hard to predict, but I had aspirations to work in film, uh, scoring, but mostly just the music industry, I guess. So no. <laughs> yeah. No is the short answer. Yes. <laughs> I, and yeah, as he's mentioned, we we always wanted to get into film, but as some of you may know, it's kind of it can be difficult to figure out how that can even happen. And we kind of got lucky and didn't have to go through a lot of the process that a lot of people that I've talked to are currently going through. So. It was kind of more of a cycle. Mm -hmm. So we had our band and we had some like production and engineering and just doing different things in the industry and then someone finding our music. Uh, the band is really what led us there. And we had to prove we could do it. It was a real test. Yeah. Do you guys work under pretty insane schedules or deadlines or what kind what's I kind of uh, all of your schedules are insane. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're never what they say they're gonna be. When yeah. you take a job, you're usually working like two or three months over that deadline. Makes planning hard, but planning is just just plan just make your plans regardless of the schedule and then work around them. Yeah. <laughs> or just cancel your plans. We're here. <laughs> or if you need to cancel your plans, yeah. Uh, how about how much time do you guys have to, to score an episode, would you say? Usually now it's around two weeks. Okay. Two, three weeks. Yeah, it really two depends. Weeks. Probably on average two to three weeks. Yeah. Um, did you guys uh, go to school for music or did you self teach, your, teach yourself uh, how to play? I'd say self-taught musician. I went to school for engineering and went to film school and stuff. A little bit, but I had dropped out of that. I continued with the audio engineering. I got a degree in that. Yeah. So I was more working in production, like mixing and making records. But me, all the musical side of it, self taught. Kyle? Yeah, no, I, I didn't go to school for music. I went to school for design, uh, graphic design. Um, just made music on the side. And I'd argue that I still don't know how to play music. <laughs> Yeah, I um, always be with other composer friends now that I'm meeting, and they're like, oh, you're playing in Mixolydian F minor. I'm like, I don't even know what F minor is. Right. <laughs> like, just play. He's like, you play in all the keys. I was like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know the names of them. Right. Well, I think that's not really that important. Well, because you guys are building, like, a sound world experience. It's not so much about, like... That's more for communication so that artists or musicians can play together in a room. Right, right. Like knowing music theory and stuff. Yeah. Like this is the key, this is the time signature, we're gonna do this here. It's really just about the language, about communication. And but do you do you use any other musicians or is it everything done in house with the two of you? Sometimes we work with other people, yeah. Um, yeah. depending on the project if it makes sense. Um, 
but not, yeah, I don't know, not very often. Unless there's a demand for it, we feel like we, someone can bring something to expand what our palette, I guess. Yeah, if we need a particular instrument that we don't know how to play, <coughs> we'll try to record someone who knows how to play it, <laughs> rather than trying ourselves. Right. I'm just, yeah, that's fairly common. Um, can you talk us through the story about how you're in this band, Survive, and then you get a call to do a show, you know, first time ever, and, uh, and kind of how you got into that world? It was an email. <laughs> <laughs> we'll start, start, start with Survive. Like, how did, how did the band, like, kind of kick off and that the album that you created that the Duffer Brothers discovered? There's definitely a point where we, everyone consciously made a decision where the band was becoming not just a hobby, but something we're gonna take serious. And at one of those points is when I decided to move to Austin, Texas, where all the other three members were, right. so that we could actually complete and produce the records and put them out and take it very serious and play shows and kind of be a real band. Yeah, Mark and Adam and I were living in a house together, and Michael came down one weekend and brought some stuff and we ended up writing the first song that we ever called Survive that weekend. We put it on MySpace. And we put it on MySpace. We gave it a name. Anybody know? <laughs> Do people know that? MySpace? Oh. Um, and we, yeah, and then he came down every weekend, every other weekend for a few months, and then yeah. there was a synthesizer store opening in Austin, and he knew how to fix synthesizers, and they had a synthesizer band. So I was like, um, down to Austin, play in the synthesizer there's band, this, kind work of a, at the synthesizer store. It makes sense. And there's a scene and a group of just the, the music community in Austin, too. Mm -hmm. Experimental kind of musicians and people that were artists, like, just hanging out. So it made a lot more sense than being in Dallas. That's where you came from, Dallas? Yeah. We're, Kyle's from Dallas, I'm we're from, both Dallas. from Dallas. And yeah. one of the other guys, Adam, is from Dallas. Right, because you knew each other long before, right? We met when we were, like, 13. 14, 13. Yeah. And so now the band is formed. You're you're all in Austin. You make this album, and the Duffer Brothers insert it into a teaser or yeah, it was like a sizzle yeah. trailer. So it's like they cut a bunch of different movies, like or it was like Portrait Guy, Shining, Steven Spielberg stuff, like Steve Jaws. Stand by Me, Jaws. It was all this stuff cut to kind of tell us this narrative of what Stranger Things was gonna be. Yeah. Kind of a big mood. It was a mood board, really. And then it had our music. It's one of our songs. What was the name of the song? Dirge. Dirge. Can you find it on Spotify, iTunes? Yeah, it's the last find song on our, on our first LP. It's kind of like a long, epic. Dirge. Dirge. <laughs> <laughs> so they put it in, and then how did you hear that they're using your music and that they want you to do the show? They contacted us directly told us kind of what the synopsis of the show was. It was, it was we're making this sci-fi drama with Winona Riders on board. It's being put out by Netflix. Um, it was just enough things that were just like, oh, wow, is this a real email? Because <laughs> 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 look these guys up. We're like, yeah. Well, they sent, they sent the trailer in that yeah. email, and they also sent their movie book. Well, I think maybe they, we had to wait a second before they could send us that stuff. Actually, no, I think they just sent it over. Yeah, they just sent it, because there, there wasn't much security. There was no hype on the show. It didn't yeah. exist yet. And they had been turned down by, like, 20 studios already, so they were just <laughs> used to just kind of, like, throwing stuff out and having people reject them, <laughs> which I think is funny now. Yeah. <laughs> it's probably, it's, I think it's the best thing is that it happened with Netflix and the way it went down, where there wasn't really anyone creatively trying to constrict... What right. they were doing, they just were like, "Here's the mic, make your thing." Which is why I think it's a success, Absolutely. and that's why then they hired us. It's like fresh on the scene directors, fresh composers, all the fresh new kids, fresh <laughs> new <laughs> faces that were on the show, new talent. Yeah, we weren't even fresh. We were just like unknown. I don't. <laughs> <mean> <laughs> like, it's not even like we had one thing, and they're like, "Oh, these guys have done something. They're the next guys." It's like. Can these guys even do it? <laughs> well, obviously you did. 
We had uh, to pitch. That was an interesting Oh, you had process. to pitch? Oh, okay. Yeah, we sent them a lot of music that we, just from reading about it, we were like, this stuff might be good. So sitting here, we've had a folder of stuff we were going to send to, like, library music houses. So instead of doing that, we just sent them anything we curated, like, a, about, I don't remember how much music, but a pretty decent amount. Yeah. Of just mood and textural kind That's of amazing. sounds. And it, was, it wasn't specific enough, and really none of that stuff got used. So then we had to do character, like themes, and send over specific pieces of music for the show. But it was all based on the scripts, and it was based on character descriptions. Yeah, they didn't even have a cast at that point. What time? What time was that? What about what? Like what? That would have been. Well, we we I think we officially got the job in November. Two thousand four. August. <coughs> we go to work. We come home from work work on these little pieces of music. It was about six weeks. <coughs> it, was, it was July, it was the 4th of July. Yeah, yeah it, was. it was. It was the, the 2nd of July, because we sent them stuff over on the 3rd of July, and they mm-hmm. said, oh, it's like Christmas came on the 4th of July. Yeah. <laughs> we sent all the music, so I remember that, yeah. And um, that's where some of the cast, like the information, like people were like, oh, they use your music to cast and stuff. Well, like they were sending us casting reels, and then since we had like written a theme for Eleven based on a description of Eleven, they were like playing different elements of our score against the kids' okay. casting audition. Oh, that's fascinating. And that kind of helped seal the deal with us, with being able to put those things together early on. Yeah, I've, I've never like heard of that before. That's really cool. Um, how many composers are in the audience, by the way? Can you raise your hand if you're a composer? All right, so we got a nice, nice, uh, and then I guess the rest of you guys must be just music fans and Stranger Things fans, so that's great. Welcome. <laughs> um, well, let's talk about uh, the, you know, the, the main theme, which is the theme everybody knows. You guys won an Emmy for it. You got two Grammy nominations for your music, so let's dive into that theme because everybody knows it, recognizes it. Okay. So when, how long did it take to kind of formulate that? How many drafts did you have to do and kind of to make it the final picture? I think there were like, I would say roughly seven or eight drafts, but it was kind of done in a way that was a little bit backwards. It was created in a concept. They said, we really like this, but then there was still no actual title card sequence. So there was no real timing for the music to work to. So once they started cutting that, they eventually finished the timing of that Bef- and then they couldn't go back and change it, so we had to make sure this title theme was written to the actual edit to the picture. Yeah. There's this it thing in T where um, actors and producers have contractual agreements that their name shows up for a certain number of time on the screen, which doesn't always fit musically. Or it's like before <laughs> another person on the show. Mm-hmm. Production standpoint. So, and then they, ha- they want everything to hit on these cuts and it doesn't always work out mathematically or musically so mm-hmm. you have to get creative in how you can make those moments hit and I think that's what led to most of the revisions yeah that's what led to most of the revisions it's really a music yeah. editor's job so hire a music <laughs> editor but I don't know I, th- uh. I think it came out fine um, would you ever release those drafts b-sides uh, or is it just is it very made, similar? We made an extended version on the first volume one of uh, the, the record. The, the drafts are really not, it's not significant enough of a difference to really release, I don't think. It's just something happens. There's the, the demo is uh, online somewhere. You can hear it. Oh, really? Which is essentially just the lead melody and the bass progression. It's real simple. It doesn't have all the parts. How does it feel when you hear that theme pop on like everywhere? Because I'll, I'll be at a shopping mall and I'll hear that <coughs> theme pop on. I don't really notice that. You know? Okay. Maybe I'm just lucky. It doesn't happen around me. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard a ringtone like once. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Not so much anymore, but like in the, the first eight months or so that the show was out, it was inescapable. It would, it would like pop up in clubs. I remember I was at a nightclub and they would and they would play that theme. Oh, there's so many. It was before they played it actually before this Tangerine Dream event. Was it their version? 
No, no, it was it was the soundtrack version, but uh, it just was so cool to hear that kind of come up in a different context. I know Blink-182 was playing at the <coughs> Ocean concerts. Really? Yeah, my friend was on tour with them, and they would like play it before they went on stage. Wow. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> no, I wouldn't, wouldn't think, so, think that, those two things together. I no, I, I don't put Blink-182 and, and Stranger Things together. But um, So obviously you guys are co-composers, so do you always write music together, or how does the collaboration actually work? We don't always write together. It's a little bit of everything. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes, sometimes we'll... It's almost become in stages the way we work, where we might create some ideas together in a separate and then just kind of go out. We have like the key tracker. We just assign different scenes and like we'll each of us will take a shot at it. But then we'll start developing themes and stuff we're sharing across and writing on each other's stuff or using the other person's thematic material, melodies and such. So it is it's kind of always collaborative, but then it seems like towards the end we'll come in and we'll start and then it's just fully writing, collaborative, yeah. fully collaborative. I, I don't know why it works that way, but you just do the production timeline, and at the end, it's good to have both of us in the same place. I would produce it for that, so they can talk to us, get feedback, and then we can turn around something quick. So we start writing on it together. Do you guys ever like read a script or or go to a spotting session and personally be like, I want that scene, like I want to try that one out, and you know? I think so. I, mean, I think we both just. Yeah. Try it. Yeah. <laughs> but that doesn't mean that the other person's not going to try to write something for you also. Yeah. It's not always the best use of time, but whatever. If you write two pieces of music for the same scene, maybe it'll work somewhere else. Right. Yeah, yeah. that's the thing. Not every, you have to like let go as a composer to a degree because it's for the, uh, for the director more than you. So you have to learn how like, okay, they don't like this thing I think works perfect, but then it probably will end up somewhere else later or it just goes in the library. Uh, what's kind of one of the most challenging aspects of, of scoring for film and TV for you? Comedy. Comedy? Comedy. <coughs> Comedic moments. Yeah. Yeah, easy. It's the most difficult for you? Yes. It's just frustrating. <laughs> <laughs> Have you done a lot of comedy, or where, where does that come into I mean, play? <laughs> um, not a lot, no. We haven't done a lot. We did Valley of the Boom, which has a pretty decent amount of comedy. Oh, right. And then yeah. Stranger Things does have its kind of whimsical moments. If the, the temp in Stranger Things is really getting out, of, it's been out of control for a long time. What it'll, be like, it'll be like Finding Dory or like... <laughs> it's just so bizarre that they throw some of the stuff in there knowing... It'll, it'll be like, like cartoons. This isn't going to be what really? we're Really? Slide whistles almost, <laughs> is all I'm hearing. <laughs> yeah. Stuff that's like Mickey Mousing the, the jokes and stuff. And we're like, wow, this is, and they're like, just do your thing. Just do your thing. Right, just do this. that, just make it And we're like, okay. okay. I think that what, That's kinda what we found is usually if, if you just mute the music and look at the shape of it and see where it gets louder and everything and see the rhythm of it, that's more or less what they're, not always. Yeah, but the pacing, you, the, the temp usually has like, there's the shape, which you can dynamically see. Then there's the pacing you can listen to, and then there's the overall like kind of mood that you can interpret that the directors are why they chose that piece. And then if there's shifts in it, you know, like if it directly has like a tonal change within, you kind of just put markers and you note that, and then just mute it, just like ignore, try to forget it ever existed. Just That's try to retain right, those right. few things that you need to know about it. Yeah. Like why whistles. they picked it. <laughs> Where did the slide whistle hit? <laughs> <laughs> now you I have. I think there's really been a slide. So. No, <laughs> maybe not. Um, Is there a hidden mic? Yeah, it's over there. It's back there. there. Uh, oh, I guess we're gonna get mics now. <coughs> okay. <coughs> I don't talk very loud, so. Sure. Here we go. Hello. Testing. Is, Is mine on? Yeah, it's on. Uh, okay, well, to continue, uh, you guys did your first feature film, Native Son, at Sundance. What was that experience like in contrast to working for television? <laughs> well, I don't know if I'll answer your 
your question directly, but I will talk about it in, in a way. That's okay. Um, <laughs> Rashid was, was really uh, receptive to just about everything we did. We never really got any negative feedback, which was really fun. Um, <laughs> uh, but I, I don't think the score suffered because of that. Given the, the subject and just the tone of this movie, we knew that we couldn't do something that sounded like Stranger Things. It needed to be more organic and just less, I mean, it couldn't just be like poppy scent stuff over anything, really. that would never work for this film. So we, we had to make some sketches and decisions on how we were gonna try to tackle that without without using the sense and ended up finding uh, kind of a guitar patch that's run through a bunch of effects that kind of um, sets the tone of the, of the of the movie and recurs through throughout and then also using a lot of drums and other acoustic instruments and just playing them in really bizarre ways and manipulating that. That's 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 what we ended up doing for the score. Um, as far as the process, I don't know if it was that much different from just because it was a film. I mean, we didn't have as much time, but it's also only an hour. Well, it's about two hours, but it's two would, hours. Uh, I would consider the process for this movie almost similar to going all the way back to the very beginning of Stranger Things season one before when it was just us like we got to read a screenplay a script and have the ideas about what it would maybe would be and try to like sit down and create it out of context from a having picture immediately like we had to f try out a lot of stuff to see what tone was going to work and then you wouldn't we knew we couldn't be sure until we got the picture and could put them side by side which is always interesting. Because um, with TV, a lot of time lately, it's just, here it is, now you go, like, go. You just kind of have to score it fast. So there was, this time it had that creative, conceptual process, again, where we got to try out a lot of stuff until we ended up at like, kind of the tone that would set the, the sound of the whole score. Which is, that's a really fun process, but you don't always have time to do it. So, kind of had that. Um, to kind of dig into the nerdy side of sound making, um, because obviously the title of our panel is called The Sound of Stranger Things, can you go into any detail as far as equipment or samples or any sort of uh, thing you're willing to divulge of making some of those sounds? I will share all of that, I just don't know where to start. It's a long... <laughs> just, just select one or two. That's tricky. How to answer questions. Um, okay, I'll do it. Okay. <laughs> um, so, synthesizers, obviously, um, old ones, primarily. Um, there's a lot of ARP synths on this score. ARP 2600 being like the classic one, which we use to make a lot of the big boomy and like kind of, I don't know what you would, maybe like a tuba would do in orchestral score like wow you know the, that there's like a pretty iconic piece of music that recurs through throughout Stranger Things um, and that's the 2600 um, doing that uh, a lot of I don't know there's so many um, tape echo pretty good there's so much. I mean, it's like, <laughs> name a synth and we'll be like, yes, we have it or we don't. We use a lot of those. <laughs> we probably do. Like, a lot of them, just the, the tone or like the pads or soundscapey stuff. We use a lot of like Prop 5 and Prop 6. Um, they also save a memory. That's a great thing when you're composing stuff to recall a sound. Whereas before the show, we didn't really have that many synths that could save any sound, so. Yeah, we, we literally actually we, bought yeah, we bought that some synths that could save sounds. Like, we're going to have to be able to recall some of these sounds. And share those sounds <laughs> with each other. Um, That's funny. 
and tour to like play the show today. That's good which timing. We put those sounds, a lot of the sounds in. Um, I think the the whole process of just like taking the sound from the band or taking the sound that's just us, I guess, the, the music we make and keeping it true to that, keeping the production quality, doing the mixes. Um, we have we use a lot of effects. We are shy on that. Um, keep trying to do experimental techniques, trying to figure out new ways to keep it exciting in the studio. Um, especially with processing new chains. I wouldn't necessarily say there's a template. There's never a template. So there might be some go-to things that we assign, or we know how to make this sound now, so we'll use this. And this year we've started cutting up uh, our own stems and making our own sample instruments for like stings and rises and hits. And especially things like when they've had you make like a uh, hundred different rises at the end of a cue. Like, all right, I make it rise really big and snap out. Yeah. We're like, well, shit, we've done that like a hundred times, and it takes like you know three hours or something, or it can take thirty minutes. But now we just have them like in a stack. We'll just try to like reuse them. Yeah. Rise so. and snap out. Yeah. Not a lot that's of a, sampling. That's a very but... common TV thing for a lot of TV composers. That yeah, resampling yeah. yourself is is good. Resampling yourself. Yeah, just like resampling, making your own instruments out of your own sounds and your own production. Because then you're, essentially, it's, it's still you. It still sounds like what you put a lot of time and effort into. Um, can we look forward to ever seeing you guys use an orchestra? Yeah. <laughs> you can look forward to it. Yeah. <laughs> I think the right project will come along. I think that we would probably start with a smaller ensemble first. I mean, that's we've talked about that a lot, a lot, um, and just haven't found the project that calls for it yet. Um, a full orchestra, probably not anytime soon. But that's, I mean, I'm not gonna say no. Definitely, but we have a few ideas for like. We know Quartets how and trios and things like that. What were you going to say? We've just discussed the process a lot about how we want to do it. And um, it's going to require working with a creative team of people that play those instruments. So not as much like the academic, just here's the sheet music, play it type people. Mm -hmm. um, that's, so it's, we'll get the right project and then we'll, we've been talking to people this whole time, trying to kind of figure out who we would want to work with. And then hopefully once the project comes along, we can, you know, make it happen. Yeah, there's an amazing group in London called London Contemporary Orchestra. I don't know if you've talked to those guys, but that's who like uh, Tom York and Johnny Greedwood and a number of composers, Mika Levy, <laughs> used to create, you know, unique orchestral sounds. So, sorry, a plug for <laughs> an organization I don't work for, but they're great. Um, what was the first synthesizer you've ever It sounds like a good recommendation. Yeah, I just was listening to it, I was like, oh. But yeah, first synthesizer you ever I bought a synth at a pawn shop that said synthesizer on it. It ended up not being very cool. I didn't understand why the modulation didn't go fast enough. Uh, couldn't make like Devo sounds or something, but... Um, the first synth I ever got that I really appreciated was a Roland SH-101. Kyle? Okay. Um, the first, technically the first synthesizer I bought was um, a Korg, or a Univox Mini Korg, Mini Korg K1. It doesn't, it doesn't really have like many settings on it, but it was the first synth I got. Typing synthesizer into it. <laughs> um, and, but the first real synth I got was um, a chord monopoly, and I still use it a lot. Play it a lot. Yeah. Which one do you really want, or you've always wanted? I've bought most of them now. Yeah. <laughs> Not really. I mean, there's some really expensive synthesizers. Um, I would love to have a big surge modular still, but I. Don't have three hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> Not yet. Hmm. I don't know. Um, 
I've still, ever since I was young and was like, young, I don't, I don't really know. Uh, ever since I was a fan of like Brian Eno's production stuff, I always wanted to be CS3 because seeing those videos him with Roxy Music mm -hmm. and stuff like the Putney, but I still don't own one. And then they're just this wacky, not well made thing. And I've serviced them and stuff, so I just know they're not worth $12,000. And they basically just make like wacky noises, so uh, I still want one. <laughs> Is this the one used on Blade Runner? No, that's oh. the CS80. Okay, see, I don't know anything about synthesizers. So. <laughs> um, do you, so, Stranger Things, obviously, you were talking about how it cut together, uh, you know, Stephen King, uh, Steven Spielberg films. Did you guys grow up watching those movies? Did you feel like a strong connection to the series? I like a lot of Stephen King. I read a, like I like his movies. I kind of like kill like a kid in the first two minutes, and it's like supposed to be funny. Um, I don't watch that much. I like Steven Spielberg movies for sure. I wasn't aware of like what the scores were, like what ET's music sounded like, as much as I was familiar with growing up with movies like Big Trouble in Little China or something like that. Um, I, I never really connected what the score was to those films, but I've seen pretty much all the classic 80s movies. I was always a fan of them. Yeah, I don't really have anything to add to that. Like, I grew up uh, watching all those movies and didn't really pay attention to the scores. Yeah, we were young and it's impressionable. And yeah. <laughs> you, you like enjoyed it, but it was more of like the whole nostalgic feeling of those things. Of course, yeah. I, I also... Uh, kind of got familiar with film music later in life, even though now it's my world, but um, obviously growing up with those films, you're not necessarily listening to the scores uh, distinctively. Uh, now that you guys are in this world, what, uh, which um, soundtracks kind of stand up to you? Like past or present or whatever. Okay, all the way. Um, this question. You can always go back to an experience like the whole, our whole band had when we saw the movie The Keep. Uh, it's not, it's a Michael Mann film. Uh, it's got a Tangerine Dream score. It's early production value. It's a well, weird story. Sci-fi, but the music's very epic. And, I mean, you wanna, you wanna add on some stuff? Yeah, sure. <coughs> I mean, you mentioned the Tom York score, which is Suspiria. And I, I thought that was really, really well done. Um, and I think I actually heard a live recording of them performing. Was, I'm sure it was with the group that you mentioned. And that, that's really great. I mean, there's, there's the songs that people, I don't know. It's, he's kind of pissed off a lot of people by um, having the, the vocally driven songs over some of the scenes in that movie. And I, I know a lot of people that are really upset by that. It didn't bother me as much, but... <coughs> The, act, the score outside of the, the pop songs, um, I think, is, is really interesting and uses a lot of techniques and things that I can't even tell what's going on with some of that stuff. I don't have any idea what instrument they're playing at certain times, which is always a really nice thing for me. If I can't tell what's going on, then that's, yeah. that's, that's really uh, exciting to me. Um. I guess there's a lot of there's a lot of scores that have like <coughs> kind of an iconic. You're like, oh, that I wouldn't do that, but I really like it, like Giallo films and what like Goblin did, with a lot of movies. And then there's also just stuff I would listen, to, I would put on in the background, whether it's the movie or the actual record, like Solaris or Kronos or something like that. It's like more cosmic or experimental music. Um, picking your favorite scores is. That's tricky. I know, that's so pretty for me. Um, I'm gonna ask a few more questions, but I'm gonna open up to audience questions in a little bit. So if you have a question for the guys, start <laughs> doing it in your brains and ask it in a little bit. Uh, what's your favorite musical moment from Stranger Things? <laughs> favorite musical moment. You could do a top three or whatever. <laughs> I, okay, um, in the second season, I don't know if it's my favorite, but I like it. Um, 
when Eleven comes back from her stint in Chicago or whatever, and she like saves the day. There's like just this cue that we had in the first season that we redid, and it's just kind of like her walking in the door, and then Mike and like crying, and it's kind of epic, and then it dro- drops to the credits, and it's kind of like this like badass song. I don't know. <laughs> it's one of my favorites yeah. too. I yeah. love that I, moment. I agree. <laughs> Almost like we had to fight to keep it. They were almost took that out, and we were like, "What guys?" They just yeah. If we had to walk on the stage that day, we went on the mixing stage, and the reveal, they just didn't think it was enough. But we were kind of like setting up the whole. We were trying to set up the whole, the whole scene through the credits, just like how it'd be a really powerful ending. Right. And we kind of, I, I was like, "You can't take that out, and you definitely can't replace it with what." you're about to put in instead. Well, they're gonna put in a song or They were gonna put in a piece of music from season one oh. that just had like more drive and we were like, we were just like, no. And I, I just told the music editor, I was like, take these hits from this one. We'll just like they, put those specific yeah. moments to accent where you want and then we're gonna keep what we did. Which is actually, as you said, is this theme that originally we wrote it season one when they were discovering Will's body um, and then they ended up using Peter Gabriel there. So we had this theme, which not many people realize, there's this progression that is the cue like crying, it's um, she'll kill you, it's mm-hmm. the return. It's basically just throughout the show a lot, but it's really just a chord progression. Right. Um, it's that it's really kind of dark, heavy. It can progression. be epic or it can be kind of cinema, like, it, it, like, it, like it's also, yeah, in the, the, it was like in the climax of season one when Eleven is like defeating the Demogorgon. It's the same chord progression. Oh, yeah. oh, it's just, yeah, played on a very different sound and it's kind of it's a, really, it's slow. Like really slow and serene. So it just has a very different feel, even though it's more or less the same piece of music. So we've been subliminally putting this chord progression in our minds for seasons. Are we going to get it in season three? Yeah. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> There's... Spoiler, <laughs> it's coming. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's a theme. <laughs> we wouldn't be doing our job right. Right. Um, uh, my last question for you is, uh, what sort of project would you like to do in the future? Film, TV, or otherwise? There is a project that's coming up that I think will be very fun, and I can't tell you anything about it, so I don't want to do that one. Like that's okay. not a very good answer. Um, I don't know. More dramas. Like I enjoy dramas. No comedy. Yeah, not so much in the comedy, but I drama. Just, you can still have jokes and dramas. Yeah, just don't right. have to punctuate. Just them. don't have like, to score the slide whistles. Yes. <laughs> um, I, well, we've done a little bit of interactive stuff like with, with VR and, and things like that, but. Um, other versions of interactive performance, I think, are, are pretty interesting to me as well. I mean, I want to keep doing movies in theory, but pretty much open to whatever, as long as it's fun and music. Yeah. I could just some kind of just more challenging um, features that make us expand um, on what we've started doing and how we've tried to diversify our sound over the last year. If you look at all the projects we've done, and then just something new, something that inspires us. Yeah, Kyle brought up the, the VR project that they did. It's called Spheres, and it's very hard to find. I found. Like it's hard to experience yet, but hopefully it'll come to those who might own a VR set. But um, it's a really, yeah, do you just tell us a little bit about Spheres so that people can be aware of it? Okay, um, it is available. Uh, well, so, okay, let's back up. It's called Spheres. It's a three-part um, VR series. So each episode is 13 minutes or so, um, and it's about space and the creation of the universe um, and the sounds that exist in the universe. Um, you get to go through a black hole in one of the episodes, so that's kind of a unique experience. Um, it's narrated by um, Jessica Chastain, Millie Bobby Brown, and Patti Smith. 
I guess I did that in order. So it starts with Millie, and then Jessica, and then Patty to kind of through show three ages of influential women telling the stories of science and and the universe. Um, and it's I don't know if you've never done VR, it's pretty it's pretty weird to get in there. It's it's um, trippy for lack of a better word. <laughs> Uh, we got to make a bunch of weird sounds for that one. It was fun. Yeah, we got to. Um, it's a very different process. So we we got to make music that had to be responsive and interactive. Like there's a point where you reach like singularity with the black hole, and you become the black hole, and then you're looking out from the center of your arms, and you can see like these it's supposed to be like uh, gravitational waves, and then you're, you're actually influencing the way that the different layers of music we've written come in and out and it's kind of like a game but it was very different and it's a bit challenging because the format is not universal yet so it's, we're working you know very on a very technical side of things trying to figure out how we're going to make this musical and interactive and all this stuff at the same time it's a pretty different process than scoring there's no timeline there's no time code so you have to getting the syncs and getting all the moments to actually hit the, the sync points. And You're the in the room with the coder. Yeah. yeah, because everything, depending on how long you do one scene or what you do in a scene, it could make it shorter or longer, so you have to cut up your music in a certain way that makes it flexible and able to be coded, which is probably pretty similar, similar to how you would do a game, but we haven't done that before, so. And where can people experience it? How? So it's right now. It's only on. It's on the Oculus Rift um, store. So you, and you can buy it on the store. I don't know how much it is, but it's probably not that much. Um, and they're doing pop ups. There's a there's a pop up in Montreal at the Phi Center right now, where you can go in and you buy a ticket and you can go do the experience because not everyone's gonna go spend like fourteen hundred dollars on a headset, but hopefully they'll spend twenty dollars to go see some experiences. There's one at Rockefeller Center in New York right now, and I don't know of any other ones that are specifically planned, but I know that that's kind of, that's the format that they're in Paris right now. Oh, there's a gallery opening in Paris on Tuesday. I guess that's gonna be, oh yeah. The closest one. That's the closest to here, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't know how long that one's gonna be up, but the other ones are like 45 day runs or something, and then this one, cool, I don't know. Yeah, I've, I've done all three episodes, they're pretty incredible, so I hope you guys get a chance to experience it. Um, so I'm gonna open it up for questions. If anybody has a question for the guys, please raise your hand. You can stump them with whatever detail on the series you want. Go ahead. <laughs> no, I'm not okay. sorry. Yeah, I can hear Yes, <laughs> I, uh, thank you for being here. I suppose that uh, John Carpenter is very important for you as also his movies, his music, but uh, what is his influence for your job? For your, and what's also your favorite movies from John Carpenter or music? I'll just repeat, so he's just asking about the music of John Carpenter, how it influences them, and what their favorite John Carpenter movies might be. Um, there's a little bit of John Carpenter's style of it, within the music. It's, I think, I was influenced by it, but not as much as people always refer to the show. Um, early, I guess. Okay, let me try to think. He has this way of making sequences and playing dissonant notes in a way, or playing cluster chords. That I think are really unique. The way he like walks the melodies, or the way that like trap music is basically adapted, and like electro from like the early '90s, and like even stuff like Miami bass. Uh, there's a lot of influences from the sequence, or basically just what was like Halloween, that's been turned into this classic way of. I guess it really is kind of an ode to John Carpenter in a way. It's kind of got this nighttime kind of feel. Um, my favorite scores, 
I'm not sure. I am wearing this really silly hat, <laughs> which is not that great. I think this was Alan Howarth that Sorry, did this one. Yeah. Um, mine, uh, Halloween 3, was probably my favorite John Carpenter, which is nothing like any of the other Halloweens. I don't know if you've seen it. It's, it's a completely different story. <laughs> it's, I know. It's just, but that, I really like that score. That one's good, sorry. I'm just trying to think of like what his, I don't usually put on his albums. I did listen to his new record, um, yeah. which was good. I think he did it with his son. I think his son scored the new one. Um, like The Fog, I like the more experimental kind of soundscapey stuff too. Um, I do appreciate, like, I did, I mentioned already Big Trouble in Little China. I really like that movie because I grew up watching it like every day. I know for some reason it's basically Mortal Kombat, which is really funny. Uh, but the opening scene is just like the sequenced music, synth music, and it goes for like 15 minutes and you should get so like, it, that's not conventional. It just goes through all these different scenes, like interweaving, and there's just this driving sequence synth music in the background, and you forget it's there, but it's like, I, that's almost the only time I can think of that happening. It's cool. Any other questions? Yeah, I've got a couple. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. First one, you've already mentioned you've got your palette of sounds, you've got your themes that you carry on through the series. But how do you score an individual episode? Do you get the finished edited visuals and then have to put the music to it? Or do they say, these are the plot lines that are coming along, come up with something, and you edit it all together? How does it work? So they send us scripts, and we found that it's hard to write anything out of context to the actual show. So we'll, at this point, we'll wait for a director's <laughs> cut. We'll watch it. It's also the only way we get to somewhat try to enjoy the storyline. Is by not they're like well we have the final scene of the last episode done would you like to start working on that and I'm like well no because I you only gave us the first three scripts so I don't want to just start scoring the yeah. final scene because I don't even know what happened so you're composing as the story goes along rather than those yeah things. and if we have the leisure we'll try to go and put things back <clears throat> and like step back a little bit to try to create a continuity if we write a new theme at the end we wanted to make sure it's somehow at the beginning. Uh, you don't always get to do that, but it's nice when you do. Yeah, I mean, then that's one thing that's kind of unique to the streaming platform and that everything comes out at once is that we do have, they don't really want us to do that, the network, um, but we there's no reason why you can't go back and put something in. You know, you have your mix date for the first two episodes and then the last two episodes will be, yeah, I don't know, a month or two later. Mm -hmm. And they want to stick to their schedule, but there's really no reason why, if you write a piece of music, that's going to work better in the first episode that you can't go back. It's not like you're, it's a digital file. You know, there's no reason that you can't do that. So sometimes we can do that, and sometimes it's happened. So, for instance, I'm just trying to think how to not say something spoiling because <laughs> that would get me in trouble. But we we're going into production on the earlier side of the season and we haven't scored the opening scene because we know it might have an influence later in that in the season so we're just kind of waiting to the last minute which makes me nervous <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean with um, okay. that happened in, in season one like the opening sequence the first time you hear that which the song ended up being called kids that was one of the last things that we actually got approved because right. it was to them it was like okay we're introducing the show and it really needed to be we were establishing the music for the first time and, and so it couldn't just be like we didn't feel like it could just be something just narrative I think it had a lot to be of people important the music establishes the identity and the feel of the show so how much editorial control do you have over that Well, the temp we've been getting lately is, uh, it would make me reconsider uh, how much we have over that. But uh, uh, I'm not trying to be negative or anything, but it's interesting because I do think that the tone is created a lot by the music, and when we receive a temp that is nothing like the music that we write, it's a little confusing. I mean, if that show, show was scored in the way that, say, 
Code Jack had been done was a very jazzy kind of thing. There would be nothing like the show it is now. So you, you guys have a lot of influence on the way it's perceived, a lot, a lot of yeah. say in the way that the show comes across. Yeah, and um, season one, we kind of were like all hands on deck. Mm -hmm. like we were doing the music editing, we were doing all the mixing, we were doing every element of the production, and just delivering the score as two tracks because it was like very precious and we just wanted it to make sure they didn't go in and like scoop out the lead or like make yeah. room for the dialogue in certain ways that we just were worried and took full control um, and we're aware when they were like swapping things in and out mm -hmm. we were kind of like watching every uh, every part of the process which we might try to be involved in more because things do get swapped out and as he said there was that scene that was really powerful when people were do used to talk about how they were moved by it mm -hmm. and we were fortunate enough to be on the stage and say, like, don't take that out. Yeah. So, I hope not no listen to us. Time here, but how much do you work in isolation in your own studios where you live, and how much do you work with the people actually making the programs? And where, where do you come to Mostly you? isolated. Yeah, yeah. We, we go to spotting sessions and we talk to them fairly regularly, but. Well, for the, la for the last part of season two, we actually moved into Technicolor in LA they wanted us to be nearby to finish this, this, the show. So we were there for like two months and they were mixing down the hall. And that's the only reason why we walked in at that moment mm -hmm. and were able to see that. They wanted us close by so they could come and check on how, what we were doing and, and things like that, which they didn't do but like two times. So mm -hmm. it, it, it was good in a way, but I don't think the, um, the idea that they had actually worked out, but it was cool for us to easily walk over and, and see how the mix was going mm. while we were writing. As, as the show's getting bigger, people are they're trying to be more defensive of it and take more control, or are they giving you the freedom to be able to say, that doesn't work, keep, keep it this way? I don't think it's really changed much since the beginning, yeah. as far as the duffers and their feedback. It's, yeah. it's pretty much the same. Um, yeah. Fortunately, we have quite a bit of creative freedom which well, you did plenty instincts. of notes, but, yeah. but uh, yeah, we they pretty much let us do what we want. It's I'm just going to let some of these other people ask sure. questions, if that's okay. Okay, well, one more question then. All right. <laughs> I won't talk about John Carpenter. I was just going to say, where he, in Starman, my favorite John Carpenter film, he introduces I love Starman. He doesn't introduce the main theme until that scene where the deer gets resurrected. It's okay. like halfway through the film before the main theme comes, that's interesting. But the one other thing I wanted to ask, as the kids are getting older in the series, are you going to be modernizing the sound? So you might have started off with a, an early 80s synthesizer, but as they grow, are you going to bring in things like D50s and M1s? So, and oh, I already had, sound as the we already had D50s on there. Yeah, there's yeah. D50s in there for sure yeah, yeah. since the beginning. Wave stations and stuff. Yeah. But, I, yeah, yeah. Just, I'll do a really quick one. Um, no, we're not, <laughs> yeah. we're, not, we're not changing with the era or anything and trying to make it super time specific because we were never trying to do that in the first place. Yeah. Um, but because they're getting older, the types of music, like there's the types of like really cute stuff that does, isn't yeah. as appropriate for a teenager who's like learning Green. how to be a human. Eleven's <laughs> theme was written with the prompt, wondrous music box, like first time experience yeah. in the world. She came from being in like confined box, not seeing the outside world. So that piece of music, now that she's evolved, now that she's when you actually, a superhero, yeah. like, it kind of only works when she's when she's looking back, or she's sad, or like mm. it's going back to old memories. Whereas now, as a theme, it's this like the cute little tiny person who's really just like a baby, yeah. and now that's not who she is anymore. So mm. we're gonna have to, if we use that same melodic structure, we'll update the sounds. Yeah. There was a question back here. Yeah, we'll we'll answer this one later. But go ahead. Um, I wanted to go back to the tech music. When you got to these later seasons, mm -hmm. did you ever ask them uh, to try and attempt to your music from the first season? And do you are you okay that they're still using other bits, or would you rather they were attempting with your previous music? We do ask that they attempt with our music as much as possible, and we try to reuse it if we can. And more narrative situations where it's underscore and it's more about the tone and the color where it's not a direct theme necessarily just to keep it continuity and 
maybe we could possibly have a few piece of scenes where we don't have to write, save us some time. But we, we would prefer that the music is somewhat in the wheelhouse of what we do. Whereas I know it's not always something they can pull off, but. Yeah. yeah he said they, they do temp uh, with our music. Um, and also we, we've delivered libraries. There's also a bunch of cues that didn't end up getting used, just alternate takes and things that are still fine pieces of music. And so they're not putting fighting email there. No, oh, they, they are. still are. <laughs> um, yeah, and it's weird, it's kind of bizarre because some of the stuff they'll temp with is so similar to things that we already have, but they just decide to use someone else. I don't know why. But that can make it easier for us too because we're like, oh, we already got something like that, guys. <laughs> yeah, we've given them so much stuff that they can't always be focused on remembering every element of it. And like you said, we give them library stuff too. Like maybe just one day we sit down and don't look at picture and just like write out a couple ideas that we think might work. Like we know they might need some kind of driving, missiony, pacey thing. So just make a couple things like that and put them in there. And if they put if they drop it in, it's really what they want. And we can expand on it, and that's a starting point, which is which is really great. Are there any other questions? Oh yeah, back here. Do you also use the crossbody Yeah, we do. Um, season one, we used. There's, we use a lot for like vocal, choir, choral sounds, just because a lot of digital synths can excel at that type of stuff. We've also were given like Omnisphere, so here and there we'll be able to use stuff like that for those type of sounds and more. Yeah, we definitely do use software. We're not against it or anything like that. But we still like to use the hardware, and if we can and if, if necessary, <coughs> if we feel like we need to, process the software in a way that it doesn't, through some of like outboard gear or like modular stuff, um, usually we try to do that. It, it doesn't always happen, but, or it doesn't always need to happen, but we usually try to give it something a little extra that's just not straight out of the box. Yeah. Like uh, we use PPG Phonum a lot. Yeah. We run it through Tape Echo, because it's like crazy, like 18K, like weird digital stuff in there and just like soften it out. That's a really weird synthesizer. Like a phonem is, is a... It's Phonetic. A, it's like a piece of a word or it's a, a sound. It's, it's not really like a... I don't know. Like, it's a really bizarre synth and you can basically type in whatever you want it to say. Say? I don't... I can't explain <laughs> it. I don't even know how it works really. I just... But it's great. Yeah, we're not really, we're not like against modern stuff. And we actually have always used modern recording techniques and stuff in our, to make our music. Even though we use like eight ninety percent hardware, it's just we've always recorded computers and we've always used interesting techniques. Further, once you're inside the, the box, so no well, no limitations necessarily. Right. If you guys can answer this question again on the screen, and this is our last question because we're done after this, but uh, we already talked about the concert tonight, but somebody, I don't know if this is someone online, but what can we hey expect Lenny. at tonight's concert? Um, <laughs> will, will Lenny see our concert tonight? I hope he's going to be there. Lenny, can you tell us if you're going to be there or not? <laughs> <laughs> Lenny could be in this room right now. <laughs> yeah, um, it's going to be dark. In sound and visual. Um, I don't know, the light show I think is really fun to watch and then it's just gonna be loud and spooky sense music, I guess. Yeah, it's more of just this little journey that goes from the beginning to the end with uh, accenting lights and it's probably not what you'd expect. It's probably a bit I don't know, more on the- What do you expect from a show like this? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Just, I mean, we, we, we wanted to make a show that didn't feel like something we wouldn't do otherwise, even though it has to do with this really popular TV show. So we wanted to maintain some aspect of the kind of experimental side of things that we come yeah. from. So that's hopefully reflected in the show. Just like new interpretations of themes and manipulated in ways that are new for the, the audience. Um, so they're more fun for us to play as well. Just come to the show, Lenny. 
<laughs> okay, well, please help me in thanking Kyle and Michael for their time.